Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Our last speaker is a man. We just wanted to show you that alcoholism affects the male BC2. And I know that you're going to enjoy what he has to say. I heard him in Mineola about a year or so ago, and I thought it was a marvelous talk. He has made talks all over the country. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present our next last speaker, H.T. from Dallas. My name is H.T. and I am an alcoholic. Attempting the AA program with the group and by the grace of God, I took what I devoutly hoped was my last drink of whiskey on March 1st, 1948. One half hour later, I was in the AA club on two knees praying for one day's sobriety and that's what I got. That's the program. And I have been 100% successful in AA. My problem was a destructive thirst. The prodigal son had a problem, too. The prodigal son had a change of mind, and his problem was solved. He went home and was fed. Here in AA, for the first time in my life, I discovered what was wrong with me. I used to be told that I was spineless, gutless, used some willpower, but they didn't tell me that my willpower was drugged with poison. Nobody. Nobody at all sat down with me and told me that I was sick, physically allergic to alcohol, that I had an incurable progressive disease. Nobody told me that I had an obsession of the mind, an allergy of the body, and a sickness in the soul, a spiritual illness, a depravity, which is an unnatural falling away from soundness and decency. Nobody told me nothing. Here in AA, I found people who understood me and my problems. Just human, everyday sort of people. No holier-than-thou attitude. Not reformers. And if they had any concepts of religion, they were not brought out in the open. Perhaps it was our great and terrible need now being fulfilled that caused me to feel a desire that was new and strength and a confidence. It, I seemed to sense or feel that here an invisible influence was at work. Now, what was it these screwballs had and exemplified without their knowing? Little by little, I seemed to get my answer. These AAs were but instruments through which my help was coming. Of themselves, they were nothing. Here at last was a demonstration of spiritual law at work. Before AA found me, my love for a bottle had drawn me in upon myself. My world was a narrowing circle. My interest shut off humanity. Receiving sympathy from no one, my soul was squeezed dry. I was a miserable creature. I was self-conscious, self-centered, thinking only in terms of myself, having no standards but those of selfishness. That, to me, is spiritual death. Now, after I came in AA, that circle was broken down by instructed AAs who in conscious fellowship could radiate the program. His very presence seemed to say to me, Come, my friend, out of your circle. Bring your soul out into the sunlight. Here is friendship. Share it if you have sense enough. I started to drinking in my teens. In time drifted to drinking alone and I became an alcoholic through ignorance. I never finished the eighth grade. I was in the regular army, the old 4th Pennsylvania Infantry, when I was 15 years old. Twelve years of my 17 years of excessive drinking, I didn't drive a car. I've been married 27 years to the same woman. We've lived apart 12 years of that time. I have taken my share of cures. I have taken the same ones over with the same lack of success. I have tried jails, hospitals, bought cures, changed town, signed the pledge, 
moderation, noble wine, and harmless beer. <laughs> For some reason, my body, mind, and nerves will not accept what some make fools of themselves and some dig their graves. My only hope lies in a method which will enable me to forego that first drink. I cannot taste, touch, nor handle the stuff. I am with the government, the railway mail service, 26 years now. My work, and during that time I have been repeatedly counseled, threatened, probated, changed from one district to another, reduced in grade, cut in pay, and busted in seniority. And finally they pulled me off the road. And I'm still off the road, but I'm sober. <laughs> Five years, three months, and 20 days ago, I wound up my last drunk, I hope. I remember it well. Six months it was. There I was, unable to attend to my work, cut off from my family, 45 pounds less weight than I am now, high blood pressure, infected teeth, distressed stomach, people talking under my bed, I waited for... <laughs> waiting for the stroke to Dr. Promise. <laughs> now, now, March the 1st, 1948 is a great day in my history. On that day, I admit that I'm not in jail, I'm not in the hospital, not one foot of land do I possess. Every step I take is on somebody else's property. I can't do that. <laughs> lucky alcoholic God had picked out and given so bright. He has been awfully good to me. I was not picked out or selected because of exceptional talents, and I am careful always, if success attend my efforts, not to ascribe to personal superiority that to which I can claim only by virtue of his gift. I was selected because I have been an outcast of the world. And my long experience as a drunkard has made me, or it certainly should make me, humbly alert to the crisis of distress that comes from the lonely hearts of alcoholics everywhere. I keep ever in my mind the admission I made on the day I came into AA, namely that I am powerless, and that it was only with my willingness to turn my life and will into his keeping that relief came to me. And I don't go around thinking that because I have been dry one year or two years or five years, three months, and twenty days that it is the result of my unaided effort. The help which has kept me sober will keep me sober just so long as I live this program which AA has mapped out for me. And I will return to drinking when I forget where I was when AA found me. And when I do, my condition will be worse than where I left off for my sickness is progressive. When an evil spirit leaves a man, it roams about in high places in search of ease. Finding none, then it says, I will go back to the house I left. And when it comes, it finds the house clean and all in order. Then off it goes to fetch seven other spirits worse than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man shall be worse than the first. That is the law. Now, if I, after having escaped the pollutions of drinking, through the knowledge given me by a pain, I am again entangled therein and overcome my latter end will be worse with me than it was in the beginning. I work this program with fear. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of a drink of whiskey. I'm afraid of the pride that comes from growth, of the power of numbers, of comparing myself with others, or of my group with others. There are material organizations whose success depends upon its members' power, money, and position, but such material things are certainly no part of this AA setup. The success of a material organization arises out of the strength of its individual members. The success in my success here in AA is from the pooling of joint assets, 
from the union of our mutual liabilities. An appeal for membership in a material organization is based upon a person's boastful recital of its accomplishments. Now, I got in here on an humble admission of weakness. I got in here because something's the matter with me. Something had to be the matter with me. Membership is not open to the public. The motto of a successful commercial enterprise is, He profits most who serves best. And in here is he serves best who seeks no profit. The wealth of a material organization, when they take their inventory, is measured by what they have left. Me, when I take my inventory, by what I have given. Now, such sound knowledge as this cautions me to keep in my mind constantly for my 24-hour day the critical nature of my infirmity. Physical disease requires drastic measures for its cure, in many cases delicate and dangerous surgery, and I have come to know that as an alcoholic I am suffering from a serious disease for which medicine has no cure. My condition when I came into AA was even more serious than that of a man that goes to the hospital with a leg full of gangrene. After all, the limit of his risk is his life, while I risk life and in addition things more precious, sanity honor, self-respect. I don't expect to cancel out a problem so deep-seated that science is unable to cope with, with as little effort as is required for the removal of a decayed tooth. Now, it is part of God's theory that a recovering alcoholic cooperates, a cooperation requiring some degree of moral courage in the performance of difficult tasks. That old crack that man does not live by bread alone is more than a figure of speech with me. It is the utterance of a great spiritual truth. There is a part of a man that is animal. That part requires that I have bread and that in the getting of that bread, I be fitted to take my place in a highly competitive society. I must work, I must play, I must laugh. And there is another part of a man that is spiritual. And that part can only be developed by the exercises and restraints which my conscience dictates. And unless my spiritual yearnings are developed as well as my physical and mental abilities, I am unbalanced and incomplete, unable, unqualified. A fat mouth, just a wide open shot for those capital enemies of all alcoholics. Fear, regret, greed, ambition, selfishness, self-pity, laziness, loneliness. And I remember well those last years of my drinking, when I kept myself to myself, when I was left alone with myself. Living with a bottle is a melancholy business. Can you tell me of any hell worse than that of being undisturbed? Remember back what it's like never to have a phone call, never to receive a letter, never to have anyone ask for you? Man, talk not to me about those good old days. I want no more of it. <laughs> but everything in my AA stems from the 12 steps of the recovery program. Everything in my sober AA life is measured by the yardstick of the 12 suggested steps. With step one, I admitted that alcohol had ruined my life, and with that confession comes the first contentment I had known in years. And why? Because a fight had been going on inside of me, my mind and conscience on one side, this strange and savage appetite on the other. Now the fight is over. With step one, I made an attempt to get honest. I have tried to profit by that lesson so ably taught by that pale Galilean who one day set a child in the midst of a great company and said of such is the kingdom of God. Except you become as little children you cannot enter. What is meant? Two words, get honest. Why is it a child will believe anything you tell it? Because it is honest. And it is honest because it is not full of trickery. With steps two and three, I was able to come to believe that God could and would help me, and I placed my life in his hands, and what happened? A resurgence of faith and hope, a great gift indeed, for I had wandered hopeless, helpless, and blind for years through murky mazes of despair. Now, a most significant statement closes the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis in my Bible. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. 
I repeat, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Here I made a wonderful discovery that God is approachable and available and that he will help and defend an alcoholic in his weakness and in his fear. And I have found him to be a faithful friend and partner in my life's constant struggle for sobriety. With steps four and five, I was led to take an, an inventory of my life and to tell out loud the exact nature of my wrong. And when I had done that, the devil of remorse that had long plagued me was gone. The burden of evil that bent over my shoulders and buckled my knees was lifted. The sense of guilt that was inside of me went away. And with those five steps, I break with the past. I become a new person, born again, a new birth. That is not a figure of speech with me. The seven remaining steps make that just as real to me as this floor I'm standing on. With step six and seven, I made restitution to myself. By throwing off the shoddy, nasty garments of the drunkard that I was, by clothing myself in some tolerance, some humility, and some honesty, and I added to the store of my knowledge some virtue, temperance, self-control, brotherly love, and pity. I threw off, and I put on. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which are circumstances, other people, and the world. God grant me the grace to change the things I can, which are my own attitudes toward God, myself, and other people. Now, to me, it is not fair play for me to say that prayer without being willing and making an honest attempt to accept and work at step six. Step six, I became entirely ready to have God remove all my defects of character. Being interpreted, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Here is the step that separates the boys from the men in AA, between the almost willing that it might have said, and the entirely ready that it does say, lies the difference between a wet alcoholic and a dry one. Now, if I be willing, I am willing to let divine providence work on my character in order to rebuild it. Some trying measures may be used. He may put me in circumstances where someone is always aggravating me. That will teach me patience. He may give me association with someone I just flat don't like. That will teach me tolerance. And besides, my AA book says it's for me to love everybody. But I know some AAs that wasn't members when they wrote that book. <laughs> he may place me in a position of inferiority. That will teach me humility. Now, I exercise myself in humility occasionally and run tests. I like to stick my finger in a bowl of water, then out with the finger, and I stand there and look at the hole. And that's good for me. It may be brought about to where I will have to work hard. That will eliminate laziness. All the disappointments, circumstances, or whatever he may stick up in front of me, all are going to be opportunities for me to cancel out and eliminate my defects of character. I just fit in. God arranges my life. I'm just going along for the ride. If I be obedient, obedience is saying yes to God. It means loyalty to God. His particular will for my body, he will reveal to me if I listen and obey, so far as I know how to obey. If I obey what I know, I will know more. The law of my body is God's will as much as that which concerns moral action. Overwork, insufficient sleep, imprudent eating, carelessness of body protection. These are sins against God's will for the body. That's excess. And God hates a liar and a glutton and a drunkard, both of them. And, uh, <laughs> oh, the command of obedience is implied in God's dealings with the first man, Adam. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. God demanded obedience. Now Adam, the old stinker of his own free will and choice, chose to disobey and he sold me out for a mess of apples. But, uh, <laughs> 
for as by the disobedience of one alcoholic can many be made sad, so by the obedience of one AA can many be brought into AA. Now the one thing that God expected of Adam was the virtue of obedience. He did not say one word to him about faith. Not one word about honesty, humility, tolerance, resentment, love. The one thing that God expected of Adam was obedience. Now to me, the greatest speech ever made was the Sermon on the Mount. And by it, that man who rolled in the sand with his finger made obedience absolutely fundamental to all else. He closed with his strongest point. He that heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. And he that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, I will liken unto a fool. Now there it is. Stay sober or stay drunk. Study the principles, follow the directions, practice daily. The bottle says I can't, AA says I can't. I became entirely ready. Ready for what? To let go. Let go of what? Resentment, fear, dishonesty, double dealing, sinful relations, and all through the rest. It is only when I will let go of a sin that God will remove it. I ain't kidding you when that AA wagon passed by, I stepped in it. I wanted, I admitted, I made a decision, I asked, and I got it. Got what? One day sobriety. That's the program, and I have been 100% successful in AA. With steps eight and nine, I made restitution to others by putting right the wrongs that I had done them. Now they had stacked up pretty much. I put some of them off. Some of them went for the board. And some of them God had to take care of in his private office. But, <laughs> but with those four steps, six, seven, eight, and nine, they helped lift that fog that hangs before my eyes, the same fog that caused me to see not the kind, decent people about me, but instead grotesque and distorted figures, demons in the land of nightmare. Now to me, perhaps the greatest gift of all the steps, next only to sobriety, are contained in the next two steps, 10 and 11, the steps of the daily inventory and the daily seeking of a better acquaintance with God. There's the 24-hour plan, the philosophy, the rule of life, that today is the only day that lies within my reach, that today is mine to do with and to live in as I so choose, wet or dry, the knowledge that yesterday is gone forever and that tomorrow is just another word, not reality. And so today I can try with all my heart, all my mind, all my strength, all my soul. And so I can live today in all things to the fullest, securing the knowledge that if I take care of today, God will take care of any tomorrow that may ever come. <coughs> now my Bible must have foreseen AA in the 24-hour plan, for it tells me that this is the day that the Lord has made for me to be glad and rejoice therein. My good counselor Joshua tells me to fear the Lord and serve him in honesty and in truth. And if it seem evil unto me to serve, to serve the Lord, then I am to choose this day whom I will serve. Choice must be made. Not to choose is to reject. And I believe that it is possible in spiritual things to choose to believe or not to believe. And so to step 12. Step 12 told me that I'd have a spiritual awakening. Well, I, I laughed at that. But I realize now that it's impossible for me to make an honest attempt to work at the other steps without a spiritual awakening. Step 12 told me to carry this message to alcoholics. There's not a gin head in this room. I don't care who he is, what his life has been, what his experiences have been his. He has never reached the satisfaction so complete, so full, as that which comes to one who is the instrument by which an alcoholic enters into and is redeemed by a faith. Carry this message to alcoholics. Gratitude. Payback. As he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers. They stood afar off and lifted up their voices, saying, Have mercy on us. And it came to pass that as they went on their way, they were healed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and in a loud voice glorified God, giving him thanks. And Jesus said, were not ten made whole, where are the other nine? One out of ten, gratitude. Where are the old-timers in AA? 
Where are those birds that crawled in here, sick, tired, broke, hungry, drunk, got their sobriety and went home, giving no interest to the group, sponsoring no new members, attending no meetings? Gratitude, one out of ten. Were not all of them made sober? Perhaps one out of a hundred, maybe one out of a hundred and fifty. Now, step 12 told me to practice these principles in all my affairs. It's a little irksome at first trying always to do an honest thing and more especially an unselfish thing. And sometimes I hit pretty low in my average sense. But I have found that for the trying, it pays dividends in a thousand ways. Now, there's the overall gift of those 12 steps. Friendship. Genuine, unselfish, unseeking friendship. It's good medicine for me of a morning when I wake up to know that I have 150,000 friends. There are men and women in AA who have done me dozens of kindnesses, who have said nice things to me, who have warmed my heart repeatedly by their thoughtfulness, who have humbled me time and again by the tolerance they have shown my faults and my defects of character and my shortcomings. Yes, there are reasons, a hundred times over the number I could cite, for accepting those twelve suggested steps over and above and beyond achieving just plain sobriety. Those twelve steps are doing for me what I was unable to do for myself. I have humbled my pride, and yet I am not humiliated. I have fought and tied down some fear, suspicion, doubt, and worry, and never have I been more at ease. I have surrendered my most precious faculty, my will, and never have I been so free. I have made God master of my destinies, and never have I been so much in charge, so much what I wanted to be. I leave my decisions to God, and never have I been so well equipped to make decisions. I have taken on a lifetime job, and never has the future caused me so little concern. I might say that I have practically arrived at the point where I'm so unselfish that I just don't give a damn for nothing. <laughs> but I haven't got much, and I don't guess I ever will, but I've got something awful good. I got it from those two men, Bob and Bill. They gave me something real that works, something that money couldn't buy, something that makes me able to look people straight in the eye. They got me back my self-respect. They made an AA out of me. It was 18 years ago these founders, Bob and Bill, sober and unselfish, brought forth into this world its great AA fellowship, conceived in faith and dedicated to the proposition that all alcoholics can be saved. Now it is a great worldwide brotherhood, proving again and again that an alcoholic, any alcoholic so inclined, can arrest his trouble and live a normal, sober life. May God bless old Bob and Bill, in and through all eternity, and may their struggle never be in vain, namely that all alcoholics who want sobriety shall have a chance to attain it, and that the twelve steps to recovery shall always be available to the alcoholic, who wants to recover. Now, faith must work 24 hours a day in and through me, or else out I go. My faith is my belief in things that I cannot prove. My stay sober faith is of three parts, knowledge, belief, and trust. My knowledge is the acquainting myself of certain facts. My belief is accepting those facts to be true. And my trust is risking something that is very precious to me. I trust my sobriety to God for 24 hours. Now, in my daily attempt to live according to the 12 steps over a period of time, things have happened to me which I cannot explain. Things which I know you understand or will understand. Things which I certainly do not hold in regret because through them has come my understanding of my brother alcoholic and his understanding of me, his understanding that has made it possible for me to be helped, as I believe anyone can be helped if he wants sobriety more than anything else in the world. Things have happened to me which are difficult of understanding, things which I cannot explain.
nor can I say they were all sin of God. When I read all things work together for good to them that love God, the only way I can understand that is to break it down. Take a ship. There are parts of a ship when taken by themselves would sink. The propeller would sink. The engine would sink. But when the parts of a ship are locked together, they float. And so it is with the events of my life. Some have been nice, and some have not been so nice. But when they are all locked together, they form a craft that floats. And when the evil is measured and the good is counted, I find that the balance is all right and I have faith. I consider my brother alcoholic still on the other side of that door, weak, airy, patient in faith, not the favored, not the strong of the land, but an outcast, the so-called weakening of the world. I consider alcoholics anonymous, its influence, a blessing, its purpose, honor, its history, banks in honor. And I consider my brother A.A.'s who hold on and go on, hoping and believing, achieving and building, gathering knowledge, seeking for wisdom, conquering and whittling down their enlarged ego. And when the evil is measured and the good is counted, I find that the balance is all right and I have faith. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.